Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the second day of the semifinals in the FTX Crypto Cup. Magnus Carlsen, Timur Rajabov all tied up after yesterday's match. And Jan Nepomnici must defeat Wesley So today in the rampant portion to force a blitz playoff and maybe an Armageddon. Then, obviously, tomorrow we will begin the final and the match for third place. I've got big news for you. The big news is I slept eight hours last night for the first time in like two years. Not actually, but it really felt that way. Uh, I don't sleep very much, so this is a monumental accomplishment. As always, I will take you through the story of both matches. Timestamps are on the video player. And um, I just hope you guys are doing amazing. That's all I have to say. We're going to kick things off uh, in the first game between Wesley So and Yanya Pomichi. We have C4, which is the English, Knight F6, Knight C3, and E5. This is kind of considered uh, one of the mainest ways to, to meet the English opening, is to take the center. Black takes the center with E5. Uh, I have played this with white and with black, both. Uh, and this position is considered the main line. E3, bishop, b4, and now white normally will play queen to c2. This is like, I've played this hundreds of times with white. With black, not as much, but also uh, I've played it with black. Now, Jan plays a move that's not so popular in an attempt to throw Wesley off. He plays knight d5. Point being that this trade is good for white. You attack the knight, the knight moves, you take the pawn. Right? So, Wesley just plays e4. That's actually the whole reason why knight d5 is not so great, because it stops covering the center. So e4 kicks the knight out of the middle, because the knight really can't hang out over here. It'll just get, get attacked again, so it goes back. And now black just castles. And here, there are still games in, in the database. Uh, it, you would argue that, well, you get the bishop pair. Yeah, but white has no development, and black is just doing well here. So that's why white usually plays a3. But Jan came prepared with a surprise. Uh, certainly he did not uh, take a swig of any sort of alcoholic beverage prior to this and just make this up on the spot. At least I would hope not. Here Jan plays a move that I've never seen in my life and is not in any database. And that move is knight to h3. And sometimes at the highest of levels, when you need to win a game of chess, when both players have 15 minutes on the clock, you need to turn the game into a problematic mess. So knight h3 with the idea to put the knight on f4 and just defend the knight. And, okay, now the players are out of their theory, so we have b6, Jan takes the bishop, and plays b3. And basically says, I want to put my bishop on b2, and I'm going to be very happy. Now, Wesley says, you're behind in development. So what do you do to an opponent who's lacking in development, needs a couple of moves to get settled? You start a fight with them. d5. So you start attacking the center. Bishop b2, takes, takes, and you pounce. And you don't let your opponent get settled. What I mean by that is, for example, if uh, takes, takes, and castles... Jan's position does look pretty good, but Wesley can play moves like queen e7, bring the second rook to the party, knight c5, plant that knight on d3, and Jan's biggest struggle here is going to be dealing with these pawns, because this e-pawn suppresses the movement of everything, which is why Jan plays f3. Because again, this trade would be very nice for white. White would just get a very pleasant position, still have the weakness of the d-pawn, and you don't really want to solve that by moving it forward, because you just block your own bishop, right? So it's not such an easy position. So, rook a d8, takes, takes, d3, knight b4. And all of a sudden, these soft little pawns for Jan, they're getting attacked. So, Jan plays rook f3. Wesley here plays f6. f6 blocks the bishop's diagonal, but was a little bit slow. Uh, Wesley, it was better for him to go queen d6 in this position and line up all the forces on this pawn. You can't take my knight because, again, there's a pin in the end. But Wesley played a bit more slowly, and that allowed Jan to unpin. Knight g5 attacks the rook, Jan moves, and slowly begins building up an attack on the king side. You'll notice he's brought, he's brought the rooks, he's brought the knight. Now this position is no joke. Wesley plays the only move not to lose, because this sacrifice is coming, because Jan has five pieces involved in the attack. And Wesley, you can argue, has like three defenders, but they're really not three defenders at all. Uh, it's basically one defender of the king. Rook f8. And now d4. You said, Levy, you, you told me not to play this move. Yeah, well, sometimes uh, you have to play certain moves, otherwise you would lose certain material. So d uh, c5 played, but now a3. The knight jumps back to d5, and this nice move, e4. Wesley must have thought that after takes, 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 he was happy because you cannot take my knight because you lose your queen. But even for the cost of one pawn, there is a dynamite move here for Jan. Look at what the rook and the knight are both attacking. They've been attacking that for a while, Rook takes g7. Wesley here plays, again, the only move. What's worth as much as a queen? But also a queen. d3. Point being that if you were to take, you would now line up here. And I would be able to go check. Your king would move. And all I gotta do is move my knight somewhere. So 
I just immediately swarm, and uh, you're going to lose material. You're close to my king, but you're not actually attacking it. You're not going to lose the rook for a pawn, okay? This isn't guess the elo. So, queen f2, he doesn't take. Take here, and still knight e3. Wait a minute, what? So Wesley still plays knight e3, and then sacks his queen! And d2! For a moment, Wesley's down a full queen! And, like, has a rook for a knight, but he's on the verge of promoting, and there's nothing Jan can do. Jan can go here and threaten as many mates as he wants. This queen is coming, and you're going to die here. You will lose this. So, this forces Jan to play rook h7, king h7, and the absolutely insane knight takes f6. If you take queen e7, and folks, you take the d-rook, because you need to control the promotion. Right? So Wesley doesn't take, but Jan finds a geometric way to keep the king from escaping. And if the king takes the knight, which it does in a moment, it's actually king is trying to use the enemy knight as a shield, finally gets forced to take because he can't go anywhere. Wesley comes this way, he still gets checked. Finally, he decides to take. Look at this. Check. Very important you check there so that when the king tries running this way, you check on this square. Because when the king crosses the d-file, it will block its own rook. If you check on the e-file, the king goes to d7 and you lose because the king makes it back and now the pawn is promoting. It's very important you check on e3 because if the king were to lose and the d-pawn would be lost, white is winning here. Two pawns, pass pawns, queen versus two rooks, but the pass pawns would be winning. And so, folks, the players played out this absolutely ludicrous draw. And I have never seen... A repetition of moves where both guys were so frustrated after the game ended both of them were mad I've never seen something like that now they drew this game and in their next game they drew again because Wesley forced the draw I mean Wesley had the white pieces in the next round and he just kind of said you know what I'm, I, I'm gonna play the practical thing I'm gonna make my draws Jan has to beat me that is the only way that he's going to make any progress in this match he has to win in rapid right so in this game, Jan starts out with d4, knight f6, and we have knight c3, which is an invitation to play bishop to b4, the nimso, but Wesley plays d5, Jan takes, in hopes of getting probably an exchange queen's, queen's gambit decline, very positional line, very classical line, but Wesley plays knight d5, which is a thing, and it kind of looks like a Grunfeld. Basically, black gives white control of the center, but hopes to break it apart with moves like c5, Jan plays a nice move here, rook b1. This was, uh, I don't remember the exact game. I believe it was Sergei Karyakin, uh, the man who challenged for the world championship in 2016, came up with a very interesting idea, rook b1 followed by h4, h5 to attack the enemy king. Um, in this game, we got that in this position. So the point is that black has castled and the move h4 is played. And this is not a novelty, but it just goes to show you that super GMs are playing this basically in any position that they want. Uh, and maybe you go knight g5, maybe bishop d3, and you line up to h7, and, you know, you, you do your thing. b6, okay? Uh, a move that I don't think has uh, ever been played. Uh, no, it's been played, I believe it, it was played once. Uh, and up until move uh, 12, right here, the players have been following a game between Levon Ranyan, who we've seen a lot in these tournaments, uh, and uh, I believe Bos, uh, Bos Josic, although I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Uh, Croatian Grandmaster, if I'm not mistaken, Marin uh, Bosjosic, but I'm sure one of the C's in his name is not pronounced like that, but hopefully I was not too off. And in that game, uh, Marin played uh, E5. So Knight C6, uh, I don't know if Wesley knew about that game, but according to the computer, he does play the best move, so probably he did know about that game, and probably he was prepared even in this completely insane line. And Jan plays Rook H3, Rook G3, because what do you do when you gotta play for a win? You turn the game into total pandemonium. King H8, a3. Now, A3 prevents anything from coming to B4, so Wesley says, if I can't go to B4, I'll get the next best thing, which is going to A5, and I'm creating my own counterplay. Essentially, this position is black, uh, is like a parent of a toddler, and the person with the white pieces is kind of the, 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 the toddler, like, spazzing out, right? So you kind of wait for your opponent's tantrum to uh, die down, and that is when... Um, you kind of move on with life, you decide whether to deliver punishment uh, of some form or just, you know, kind of move on and pretend like it never happened. Now, Wesley doesn't need to win the game, but if Jan gives him the opportunity, then he will... I'm not, you know, you guys get what I'm saying. So, 
We get bishop d3, knight c4, and now Jan plays king f1, which is what... The, <laughs> you're not going to castle. You can only play king g1 if you can play rook to f1, right? So, knight to d6. And again, Jan can do nothing here. Jan can just play queen e2 and wait. But the match situation is one where he's got to... Again, he's got to have that toddler tantrum. I'm not saying he's a toddler. I'm saying he needs to play like a toddler having a tantrum. So, d5. Sack upon, ed, bishop b2. Let's go. All right, I'm attacking you. And this looks really nice. Because look, if you play bishop f6, I push my pawn, I fork you. If you play f6, um, I'm going to take back. And then I'm going to go knight h4, knight g6. Like, you're in trouble. Because you've weakened yourself. Wesley, cold-blooded, just takes on e4. He's like, bro, I, this, this doesn't scare me. I mean, you can take with a bishop. It's just a check. I just play king h7. You can take my rook. That's fine. I'm still forking you. So now you, you have a lot less material to attack me with, and now I win your bishop. And once again, you can take with check. That's great. That's really nice. Just play f5. I block. You can't be scared of ghosts in chess. You know, you got to really think about what, what's there and what's not there. And so rook d4, rook c3, he just guards his pawn. Um, and a few moves later, he just takes the knight. Very practical. The less pieces Jan has, right? You take, you take the toys away <laughs> when they're having a tantrum. And, you know, Jan... Uh, Jan's got nothing here. I mean, Jan fought. He did his, he did his thing, but um, Wesley just removed all the pieces from the board. So Jan kept the queen and the rook on, understandably so. No pun intended to Wesley. And, um, you know, again, as I always say in my recaps, it's never too late to lose. But in this position, uh, Jan resigned. He's under attack here and that, and um, he can take the knight, but the rook is lost and the game is over. So a valiant effort, but Wesley's so proving that he is just unbeatable. I don't think he's lost the game. Did he lose yesterday? He didn't. Wesley hasn't lost a single game in this tournament. Out of like 15, however many it took him to eliminate Maxime, 22, and in this one, uh, another 7. 29 games Wesley hasn't lost in this event. Completely nuts. So congratulations to Wesley, who wins the mini-match 2-1. to one. Well, I mean, today's mini-match 2-1, to one, but overall 2-0. Um, and, uh, yeah, Carlson Rajabov, here we go. We begin in game number one. Timur begins with d4, we have d5, and, uh, Magnus goes for a Queen's Gambit declined, and then plays the move h6. And Magnus has been doing this recently, he's been playing h6, a6, and Queen's Gambit declines. He's only able to get away with this because he's Magnus Carlson. okay? Don't copy him. I understand you're supposed to look at the world champion and go, wow, he does it so well, I wanna, like, I wanna emulate that. Look, just because the best, a best athletes in the world can do a certain thing doesn't mean you also can do a certain thing. As much as I love watching Obi Toppin dunk for the New York Knicks, if I jumped anywhere near that high, I would probably herniate all of my cervical discs. Is that the right... Is that the right medical term? I'm going to look this up before I get into the games. Yeah, that's what they're called. Okay, great. Well, now that my medical clearance is confirmed, knight f3, knight f6, bishop f4, bishop d6... Players are developing their pieces, really not much going on, and we have our first trade of the game on d5, g3, and then Magnus doesn't take back on d5, he actually takes on d4, so we get queen d4 and ed5. Okay, this is an isolated pawn position. Uh, what do you guys know about isolated pawns? Trading pieces benefits the person who does not have the isolated pawn, because that pawn will be a target. You can end up putting a rook on it, going to be very difficult to defend. So that's why Timur goes here. The point of this is to prevent Magnus from playing knight c6. And if a6, bishop a4, b5, well then, thank you, I have a new attacker on this pawn. Magnus decides to play knight c6 anyway, uh, and take a damage to his pawn structure, and now Timur castles. Rook e8, rook c1, bringing the rooks, bishop g4, bringing the bishop, knight gets out of the way. Knight rotates around to not let the pawns go forward. You understand, in chess, when you're dealing with pawns like this, isolated or with one neighbor, this is known as the hanging pawn structure, you want to suppress their upward mobility. Now, if you are a government, you don't want to do that with your citizens. Well, some do. Shout out to dictatorships. But queen b6, knight b3, you don't want those pawns to have any forward movement, which is why the moment that Timur allowed them to have forward movement, Magnus said, okay. And basically all Magnus has to do is defend the pawns. And he does so in a tactical way. He defends the pawns by not defending them at all because the knight just can't move. Timur takes, allowing the rook in, and kicks out the bishop with f3, bishop f5. So we have an endgame. 
two rooks, each side has two pieces, and it will come down to the pawn structure. You mobilize, you kick the bishop out a little bit, you defend your weakness, Magnus activates the rooks, hits both knights. Knight comes back. This rook looks stuck, man. I, I really don't like that rook, which is why Magnus brings him a friend to try to get him out. Knight b5 to try to go to d4 for the cost of one pawn. So rook takes on a2, knight d4, a6. Knight d6 attacks the rook. Magnus sees it, shockingly. And now, since Timur is going to win the bishop and he's going to lose the knight, he decides to sacrifice the knight. This is known as a desperado. He grabs something for the knight before he loses it. Then he takes, and we have this endgame, knight, knight rook four versus knight rook four. Okay, great. Who's better here and why? Nobody. It's equal. That's the official evaluation. Who has the winning chances? Magnus. Why? Outside pass pawn. And the second reason, he's named Magnus Carlsen. He should be named Magnus Carlsen. You'll have a better chance of winning endgames. So what does Magnus do? He pushes the A pawn. Then he reroutes his knight. Then he puts his knight on C4. King D3, A3. You cannot coordinate your pieces any better than this. Literally. You, they're all coordinated well. So what does Timur do? He immediately goes for the thing that has the most opportunity to be lost, which is the d5 pawn. Magnus gives a check and takes on e4. Tough decision from Tamor. He takes with, with, the, with the king to attack the knight. Now, we don't move that knight. We want it there, and we also want to improve the positioning of our king a little bit, so that's what we do. Knight jumps out to b5 to go for the pawn. Magnus plays rook to a4 check, and Timur has a decision. Where does he move his king? He decides to be active. Why not? Magnus plays rook a5. That's actually not so scary. You can't defend the knight with your king on those squares, but you can defend on this square. Magnus plays a2. Now you can't move your knight or your rook, so you move your king to get the rook out of the way. But now we have check. The king goes here. Check. The king goes here. Because if the king were to go here, you would use the knight. And you would win the knight. So king goes here. And now knight replaces where the rook was and gets into b3. And if you were to go knight d4, rook takes d4, king d4, knight b3 check. Yeah. And even if you can walk the king all the way here, knight just moves and you can't take both at the same time. And so after knight a5, Timur Rajabov resigned the game. Now I just want to point something out to you guys. From this point forward, everything Magnus did was perfect. First he gave this check. Very difficult decision from Timur what to do. Do you get closer or do you just kind of hang back? I thought king e3 was wrong when I was looking at the game. I thought king d5 was right to go here. Uh, Magnus then immediately punishes him, forcing this. Plays a2, which is the only move. Plays knight c6, rook a4, and knight a5. Only way to win. Magnus finds it. He's extremely good at defending the most nagging of positions. And he's extremely good at converting the most uh, minuscule of advantages. And Magnus Carlsen wins the first game, which takes us to the third game, because Timur Rajabov is white again. Uh, why, why did that happen? The second game was a pretty effortless draw, so Magnus follows the strategy that Wesley had of, I don't need to push with white, I can let this guy come to me. So in this game, uh, Timur plays d4, um, and uh, we have e6, knight f3, d5, and, and by the way, the exact same setup Wesley played against... Nepo, kind of a semi tarash hoping for this, 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 this. You see, there's a very familiar structure, right? Except Nepo had put his rook on b1. That there's a slight difference here. But instead, we get this trendy line that's been played a lot at this high level to take on d5 and mirror and take on d4, to take with the queen to go here, and then for white to blow everything up. And I know I'm, I'm kind of speeding past this, but this has been played a lot. Magnus and Wesley played this. Wesley's been playing this a lot. Uh, Le Quang Liem has played this versus Anish Giri. Basically, black is down a pawn. Uh, excuse me, black is up a pawn, but white has the two bishops. But black's position is a little bit ugly, but with best play should be holdable. So Timur gets this very rapid lead in development. Like, look, all his pieces. He won his pawn back. He's going to go bishop c4 and rook e1. And he's got, like, a, a slight positional advantage predicated upon his lead in development. The fact that the bishops are an opposite color, so he can actually create targets. So let's go Timur. Magnus plays bishop g7 and f5. Very natural move to attack the knight, but the bishop on g7 is activated as well. Can't be a bad move. Of course, e6 is a little bit weak. So knight goes back to g3. Rook comes to e1. 
and Magnus plays bishop e5. Now the move bishop e5 invites a little tactical sequence. Knight takes pawn, pawn takes knight, and now, uh-oh, so what do you do? f4. The bishop can't move, you would take the king. So Magnus is forced to go to this endgame where he is down just straight up a pawn, and the, the land of trading rooks. So rook bishop 5 versus rook knight 4. Very complex endgame. You can argue this pawn is an asset for white. You can also argue it's a liability because where's it going? This bishop can't guard it. The only thing the bishop can do is repel the king from moving to touch the pawn. Magnus has an F pawn, which he can trade, activating his rook. But in endgames, it's all about active pieces and weaknesses. So rook g8 attacks the g2 weakness and activates the rook. g3, not a bad move. Rook d8, hitting the king and now activating the king. Bishop kicks the king away. Everything we've discussed so far. Rook f3, targeting the weakness. Knight d4, potentially inviting a trade. Now here, Timur plays rook c3 because again, active rook and he wants to go here. So Magnus makes a massive decision to trade. Now, when you make this trade, knight for bishop, you're either just lost in this rook endgame or you have a plan to hold it. You're not winning. You have a 0% chance of winning at this level. Um, at the guess the elo level, maybe like 25% chance of winning. So now we have rook a3 attacking the pawn, b6. b6 will solidify that and guard that. So Timur goes to c3 because he's looking to go to c6. Magnus plays king e6, anticipating rook c6, and trades off pawns. One set of pawns has now been traded. These mirror each other, so it's really going to come down to over here. So we have this, and we have this. Not letting the king get active, centralizing the king. Always monitoring whether the enemy rook can actually get in or not. Rook c7. Rook h5, looking for g4. If you can trade the rooks here, white is winning. Are we clear on that? Trading rooks, white is winning. You have more pawns than black. You're, you're going to win the pawn endgame. So king, king d3, preventing this. Rook d7, king c3. Rook c7, king b3. Okay, no more checks. Okay, great. I just go back to the middle and I want to go rook e2. So we have a4, rook e3. I'm just going to give you checks. You have not demonstrated an ability to win this game. Now I go for your weakness. I don't check you forever. If I check you forever and your king gets to hang out with my pawns, those pawns are going to be suspicious of that king. He is lurking in neighborhoods he doesn't belong in, right? King b7. So, back up. Rook e4, king b5, rook e5, king c4, rook e4, king b3, rook e... <laughs> the Timur did a little dance with his king? No progress. Okay, so I got to look on this side of the board. Yeah, and here Magnus Carlsen shows why he's Magnus effing carlson okay and the effing stands for freaking place f4 i would never con consider this move i mean it, you know it would cross my mind this move is a possibility but why would you sack a pawn like how how did he how so how sure was he that getting just an, an h pawn endgame with a and b was such an easy draw well timur tried and tried and like he was going to go over here, but Magnus went this way. The thing is, you can lose the A pawn. In all these endgames, at the end of the day, it's what pawns can you lose? And Magnus realized that B versus AB is a draw. He can lose one of those pawns, right? So for example, over here, he can, he can lose those pawns. He can lose those pawns. It has nothing to do with this. It has to do with this. The king will be in time to safeguard the final pawn. And this is not going anywhere. It, look at that. Do you see? That's what Timur had missed. Timur played rook b8 and missed the fact that when he wins the a pawn, Magnus doesn't have to rush here. He can just go safeguard his last pawn first. And so some moves later, the game ended in a draw. And there's nothing Timur can do. He can't actually win the 2 on 2 and his h pawn's not going anywhere. And Magnus Carlsen holds an extremely unpleasant endgame. It is now 2 to 1. And it means that for the fourth and final rapid game... Timur Rajabov must win with the black pieces. So what do you do when you win with the black pieces and your opponent plays e4? Some people play the Sicilian, but Timur plays b6. And then he plays e6 and d6 and knight d7. And uh, this setup by black is kind of like so far, this setup is known as the hippo. I don't know if you guys don't know that. It's called the hippo. Um, but basically, we have this position. And black is saying, look, I have a big space disadvantage. Um... I am uh, maybe going to do something in the center with d5, e5, c5, something like that. But uh, that's my plan. That's my plan. I mean, I, I know him worse. But here's the thing. The, the guy on the other side, Magnus Carlsen, he doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to lose. That's the point. 
if you're playing this position for a win, you gotta, you gotta throw a punch. Magnus doesn't have to do anything. So Timur plays e5, all right? It's up to Timur to play this for a win. Rook e8, bishop f8, and Magnus just takes some space. He takes some space because he wants to go here. See, if Magnus had just played d5, we get knight c5, maybe c6. So, b4, free space. g6, queen c1. Magnus says, haha, Timur, you want to put the bishop there? You want to put the bishop there, Timur? Give me that bishop. No, 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 no bishop for you. Bishop h8. Now Magnus plays d5. Shutting down all the play of your opponent, understanding that the only way for the opponent to make progress will be to move the c-pawn, and Timur does exactly that. And yes, you can take on Passant. Well, here, ladies and gentlemen, d take c6 opens up the, the file for your opponent, and Magnus Carlsen becomes the public enemy number one on Anarchy Chess, taking my spot, and doesn't take on Passant. c4, bishop c2, knight f8, queen d2, bishop c8, shuffling. Every damn shuffling. Please don't copyright strike me for using your lyrics. Bishop g7. Rook f1, bishop h6. He can't do anything. The only way, now that the center and the queen side has been locked, is if Timur ever successfully plays f5. Okay, so king h8, queen d2. And finally, Magnus says, you can't play f5. I've spent my entire game. Somehow, you, you know, you, you ever, you ever like, uh, get to like a, a point in a chess game or just a point in anything, you go, how did this happen? So much time has gone by and this person was preparing this the entire time. Magnus this entire time, suppressed all the play and stopped Black from playing f5. He just stopped it. In all of his shuffling, the only break that, he, that, that, that Black has, he stopped, and now he has the break f4. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's over, because he will slowly trade away the pieces, play rook f1, and still the game ends in style. Knight d7, he brings the rook, knight f3, rook f3, and right here, Timur locks the rook in. Oh, it's been deflected, Magnus says. <laughs> has it really? Takes 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 hello and now this is supported queen h4 knight f5 and the pawn goes to g7 because the queen has to move and now just i take your d6 pawn i come back i push my pawn to make way for my queen and the game ends with the only imaginable move the backwards queen trap bishop d1 the queen is trapped. After queen g5, h4, the queen has no moves. You can go to g6, you can, but of course there is like queen e6 and, and this move, and uh, you, you, your queen's just trapped. So bishop d1, the very aesthetic backward bishop move, and again, this game was, this win was made possible by the fact that Timur had to play at all costs for a win with black, but still doesn't... Uh, discredit the fact like how easily these top guys can just shut it all down uh with these kind of dubious openings that have that that look for imbalance and so my friends we have a rematch of magnus carlson versus wesley so i believe we've seen this three times now in six events if not four out of six and i think multiple times in the finals they have played against each other Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is the second time in the finals. Maybe there was once in the finals and twice in the semis. But Magnus and Wesley move on uh, to get that first place prize of six figures plus 2.2 uh, Bitcoin, which is like $75,000 right now. Um, and uh, Timur Rajabov and Yanni Pomichi will fight for third and fourth place starting tomorrow. As always, absolute pleasure making these recaps for you. We are about 10,000 subscribers away from a million. So if you made it this far in the video... Um, and you're not yet subscribed, go, go, go look. Just double check. You know, sometimes YouTube, they, they, they don't realize because they always throw it into your recommended. Peace out, my friends. I will see you for the finals. Get out of here.